yeah so we talked about you know importance of uh, the incident that David went to nope and asked for the bread and then he's supposed to uh, he ate the bread he's not supposed to eat and what does that really means and we're going back and forth between the um, Old Testament and New Testament what does it mean by you know eating the uh, the bread uh, on the uh, the Sabbath and what is really important it is that the uh, the rules and it is that the law it is more important or it is it more important with you know understanding what God is really telling us resting means and then the bread means why we're eating bread like we're all here eating bread right now so this bread is actually we're taking Jesus as Jesus actually broke the uh, the bread and gave it to all his disciples you know take this bread right so bread is really important to us if we don't eat and as we just talked about you know in, in, before we start this eating the bread and taking the word is critically important in our spiritual life and if you don't eat you're never going to be healthy so that's the kind of part that we talked about Jesus said you know he was a referencing this particular story and said didn't he eat the bread that he's not supposed to eat but it's not the action that is important but why are we doing what we're doing God looks at our heart so it is not about just the eating this is this is why Jesus actually healed the people on Sabbath intentionally to demonstrate it to the uh, people who practicing the law and say you know practicing the law it is not what I want understand why I gave you this law so understanding the meaning of the the uh, commands and the law it is more important than just following the law so that was the you know point one thing I want to add to that is the things that I didn't cover I was going to actually cover in a later uh, chapter but you know, we're, uh, we're gonna just talk about one of them here so literally when you look at the story of this David lied right he literally lied to to priest so the question we have is is that right to lie it's a white lie still lie so how do we justify that lie especially David right no no chapter 21 yeah so yeah when he went to the a place called N nope right he actually lied and said he sent by the king Saul right so he he lied and because of that lie later on all these priests get killed there are 85 of them are get killed so we have to think about is that lie okay if it is a white lie so can we should we differentiate white lie versus you know black lie interesting part is there's no mention in the Bible about his lying there's no mention so then how do we interpret this so we're gonna get to that a little more uh, in, a, in a next couple chapters um, we'll continue on chapter 21 uh, read from verse 10 and David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish the king of Gath and the servant of Achish said to him is not this Dave the king of the land did they not sing to one another of him in dances Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands and David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish the king of Gath so he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks 
on the doors of the gate and let his uh, sp uh, spittle run down his beard. Then Akish said to his servant, Behold, you see, the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to have as madmen in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? So, here is the story of David now fled to Gath. And then he met with the, the king of Gath and he actually pretended like madman. So, let's think about this story for a moment. First of all, where did he flee to? Where did he flee to? Where is this place called Geth? Does anyone know where this place Geth is? We talked about it in the past. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> because it, it is important to understand where this place is. But a lot of stuff that I talk, talk about, you know, the, during our Bible sharing, you know, when we're talking, then yeah, 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 yeah. But we don't really pay attention to every details of the story. You just understand the overall story, right? And then we just kind of miss out those details. And then when you go, t you know, further out, then you don't really remember what it said. But it is in, it is important. This is why I kept saying to everyone that you need to really have all this in your head. So when you read the story, you'll be able to actually connect the stories together and see what is really happening here. So let's let's turn to First Samuel chapter seventeen. First Samuel chapter 17. So we're going to read from verse 1. Now the Philistine gathered their armies for battle, and they were at uh, and they were gathered at Sukkot, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sukkot and Ezka and uh, Ephes Damim. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the line of battle against the Philistine. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistine a champion named the Goliath of Gath, whose height was a six cube, cubits and a span. Now, you hear the town Geth here. Goliath is from Geth. Which means, because of this, this battle between David and Goliath, when David killed Goliath, Everyone from the uh, Philistine, they scattered and they lost the battle. So imagine, imagine, the people, town where Goliath is came from, they hate the name David. They hate the name David. David is the enemy who killed her fellow warrior the most strong and 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 he was the like front man of all the you know the philistine and he was uh, killed by david but imagine david went to geth imagine david came to philistine town Geth where the Goliath was born what do you think they should do to David 
Uh, absolutely. He's the f- number one wanted man. Right. So he's the first one to be killed when he goes to Gath. But the question is, David, why did he go to that town? He, you know, he knows, he knows that's not the best place to be. But he went there. So that's the question. Why did he go there? <laughs> of course. Yeah, you you'll be you will be killed, and you you will know that you know in that town everyone in the town will hate you. You know, why why would you go there? Exactly, because from David's perspective, he just. You know, fr- fleeing from one place to another, he's uh, running around and just like, you know, try to run away from Saul everywhere in Israel. But there's no other place to hide because everywhere he went, there's a, some guys reporting to Saul that he's here. So he just like ran out of place. There's no other place to go to. So he had no choice. He had to actually leave Israel. To go other place, other place the people would not look for him is the worst place that no one would imagine him to go to, which is the Geth. Because everyone knows if he goes, Saul does not even come after him to kill him. He will be killed. And that's where he went. It's like, you know, criminal try to hide himself in right next to you know police station the place where you know no one would have thought that the criminal will actually hide you know, why would actually criminal stay right next to police station right no one so they're going to look everywhere except the right next door right <laughs> exactly so that's why that's why david went there with the desperation because he wanted to he wanted to find the place most it is the most dangerous place but at the same time it is most the safest place for him so he went there because he has no other place so imagine i want you to think about it and i want you to actually put yourself in david's shoes how would he feel remember god actually you know appointed david as the next king and he used the you know uh, prophet samuel to anoint him as the next king but based on what we are seeing here there is no you know straight path that he will become a king he's been chased by saul and in every day every moment he has to worry about his life so there's no promise God is giving him and saying like, David, don't worry. I'll take care of you. I'll protect you. Don't worry. You'll be a king. There's no promise. He's not showing up in his, in his dreams or he's telling, you know, through another prophet. So there's no absolute promise what will happen. Whether he, he will die or whether he will become a king. There is absolutely no promise. So he himself does not know. It's not like God is telling him where to hide right there's no there's no communication from god whatsoever everything is a shut off so he's just like trying to just running around you know from one place to another try to hide himself and try to just not get killed by king saul and imagine how would you feel in your situation if you're in his shoes let's say god gave you a promise that like tony you know I will raise you up as you know, you know, as a as a greatest like uh, evangelist. And the next thing is you're like a chase after like a lot of the enemies, and and then you have to just like you know try to save yourself from you know people trying to kill you. 
And you don't know whether you will become a, a greatest evangelist or not. There's no promise. God is not showing you any sign whatsoever. And while you're just trying to hide from one place to another, what would you do? Hang on one quick second. As we read the Bible, these are the things that we need to think about. We have to dynamically just like put ourselves in their shoes and, you know, think about how they would feel. What would I do in this situation? Especially God is not telling anything. There's no directions. There's no dream. There's no instructions. You just, David is just doing everything by himself right now. He doesn't know whether God is leading this way. So, how do you feel? And how would you feel if you're in this position? And it's not just the one day. It's not just the week. He's been, like, he's been doing this for like years. So, if I were him and I said like, God, when is this going to end? Am I ever going to be saved? Will I live? Going back to the story of Genesis. When Joseph was living well with his father, he was loved by his father, Jacob. You know, Jacob was putting him in on a special clothes, and he loved him so much. And one day, his brothers, like, hated him. And then when he showed up in the field and then said, you know, let's just kill him. Well, Reuben said, no, 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 don't kill him. But well, let's just put him in a, like, you know, you know, some place here, right? Let's just put him in a pit. So he was able to actually, you know, save himself, not, not getting killed by his brother. And then he was sold to Egypt. So his life changed overnight, right? He was sold by his brothers and he was sold as a slave. And now when he reached to, you know, Egypt and he was actually, you know, doing well, he was sold as a laborer, but he was actually, it was a very, uh, you know, smart and he was very diligent and he was a hard worker. So he was actually, you know, promoted as the, you know, the, the master of all the slaves. So he was in a good situation. When he got up to that point, there was a no mention, no signs from God what God will do to him. There's no, no message to him whatsoever. So he got up to the point where he, he was at, the master of all the slave. He was doing okay. And all of a sudden, his master's like, wife is trying to seduce him and said, like, let's sleep with me. And then he resists because he was afraid, right? He, doesn't, he didn't want to sin against his master nor the God. So he just like tried to flee away from, from you know, master's wife. And then guess what? By doing a good work, he was a put in prison. Right? So now, once again, his situations got like dumped into the pit again. Now, no promise, no message, no dream, no instruction. He doesn't know whether he will be able to get out of this prison right nothing is clear and when there's no instructions coming from god what would you feel and you know at that time in an ancient time when you're actually put into a prison like that at that time people didn't even consider slave as a as a human and then you literally your life is in danger and you don't know what do you be able to ever going to get out of this prison? So, once again, put yourself in their shoes. Not, not, don't read as a someone else's story. If you read this story as just like someone else's story, as if you're re reading a novel or the literature, you're never going to understand their situation. You'll never be able to plug yourself and apply the things you learn from the Bible because you never be able to actually you know relate your, yourself with these these the, the people that we're reading so put yourself in 
and Jacob's shoes, I mean Joseph's shoes, and you you have to plug yourself in, you know, David's shoes. Only thing people remember is, oh, Joseph became, uh, you know, he was the, like a second man in Egypt. Wow, great. But before he became a second man of the Egypt, he was a living and it's like unknown life. There's no promising life. He didn't know whether he's going to become a second man in Egypt at all. And King David, you know, David does not know whether he will become a, a king. Well, we know he's, he will become a king later because th we're reading the whole story of his life. But if you are in his shoes at this situation, you have absolutely no idea what the tomorrow is going to bring bring to you to maybe tomorrow you'll be you, you get killed i don't know so how would you feel what would you think of god at that point uh, absolutely you're gonna feel like god is not with you you're completely abandoned where is where where are you lord what what is the promise that you gave me a long time ago is that did i hurt wrong what am i why, why are you actually putting me in these situations? I, I've been trying to be just, you know, faithful to you. You know, I try to be, just, you know, as, as just, you know, um, uh, the righteous as possible. I'm trying to do a good things. Why are you doing this to me? Wouldn't you be in that situation? Wouldn't you think the same way like I, I would? I would be in that situation. Why? Why are you doing this to me? I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be a, a good man to you. So this is the things that we need to think about. Why God is actually putting the believers and faithful people in the situations. On the contrary, so think about it, because. He's desperate. He wants to live. He wants to live. So the situation is not getting any better. Enemies just chasing after him to try to kill him every day. Now, he doesn't get help. Now, what do you do? You try everything you could possibly do. And you cannot do anything about it at this point. So there's a two different gesture or the behavior you will see. One is cursing out God and said, there is no God. God is dead. Or other approach is Lord, I desperately need you. I cannot live without you. Without your protection, I, I'm, I'm dead. So please, protect me. So there's only two distinctive approach that you will see. So let's take a look at very similar situations. As, as we know very well, let's turn to Job. Job chapter 1, there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There was born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yokes of oxen and 500 female donkeys and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offering according to the number of the number of them all. 
For Job said, "It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, though Job did it continually." All right. According to this, he was a upright person. He's not even. He's not even a Israelite, by the way. Right? He's not even an Israelite. He's living in East Side. Okay. So he's not even a believer. He is not a chosen chosen one. So he is trying to live upright life and try not to sin against the God. And then, because of the Satan, you know, provoked the Lord and said, "Like, well, he's actually serving you because you blessed him for everything what he had." That's why he's actually being faithful to you. So now there was a day when the sons of God came to presence themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, "From where have you come?" Satan answered the Lord and said, "From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it." And the Lord said to Satan, "Have you considered my servant Job?" That there he is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fear God and turn away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, "Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a, a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his, you know, possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand." And touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, "Behold, all that he has in your hands, only against him do not stretch out your hands." So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and then he lose everything what he had. All his sons get killed, all his daughters get killed, everything what he had. Get killed, and his house is a completely crumbled down. He lost every single things that he had. So, after that, his confession is. Let's read from verse twenty on. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge a, a charge God with wrong. He lost everything what he had, and his confession is, "Well, I came with the naked hands. You know, I didn't have anything." God gave it to me, all I had, and then He's taken away. So, praise the Lord. Well, it's easy. It's easy to say, "Oh, good." And once again, put yourself in His shoes. Okay. And then continue on. We're going to read from chapter two. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, "From where have you come?" Satan answered the Lord and said, "From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it." And the Lord said to Satan, "Have you considered my servant Job? And there is not like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man." Uh, Who fear God and turn away from evil, he still hold his、uh, holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason, then Satan answered the Lord and said, "Skin for skins, all that a man has will give for for his life. But stretch out your hands and touch his bones and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face." And the Lord said to Satan, "Behold, he is in your hand; only spare his life." So Satan went out and from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with 
loathsome uh, sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, "Do you still not, uh, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse your God and die." But he said to her, "You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive God a good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips." Okay, so now we're seeing the two distinctive um, the uh, people how they're reacting to the situation. Job continued to you know not sin against the Lord even though his situation is actually bad remember God did not warn him did not give him any instructions no promise whatsoever all of a sudden one day he lost everything what he had he lost all his sons and daughters everything he had the head was completely gone now the second uh, second attempt was now the you know, Satan is provoking God and say like, well, Lord, even though you taken away everything what he had, why don't you just struck him with it's like his flesh is bone that he's going to like curse it in front of your, you know, your, your in front of your face. Well, so, all right, do not touch his life, but you can do anything you want. And then Satan struck him down. And now imagine, I don't know if you ever had, you know, uh, poison ivy. Have you ever had a poison ivy? If you ever had a poison ivy, you, you, you would understand how painful that is. If there's a couple of spot, you can bear that. But if it actually spread all over your body, you have no idea how painful that is. It's not so much of like painful meanings like it's like, oh, it's so painful. But it's like so itchy that you, you can, yeah, you could not really resist not touching it not scratching it but when you start to scratch it's going to spread out like you know everywhere and if it spread out all your body you have no idea how painful that is you can't sleep you can't do anything it's like it's driving you insane imagine you're in a really really bad situation no promise, no instructions, no dream, no promise, nothing. You have no idea what what your tomorrow is going to be. So, Job did, still did not want to sin against the God. His wife said, "Look at you. Look where you are now, and you still trying to believe your God." Why don't you curse him and then die? That probably better. You know, you may see like, wow, this woman is like, it's, it's pretty bad. Yeah, but you know what? There's a certain things that you're missing. Um, let me show you something. Let's see if I can get here for a second. <clears throat> this woman, this Job's wife, it is like very hard woman's, and then you know it's, she doesn't know what she's doing, and it's just a cursing out the Lord. But there is a story is not written well here, so I'm going to show you some story here. Okay. Okay, do you see my screen? Okay, this context, so take a look at this, all right? This is actually uh, the context from the Job, all right? The place where we read. So let's take a look at um, chapter, uh, chapter 2. For we reread from 7 through 10, right? So here is a 7. Right? 
seven, eight, nine. Okay? So let's take a look at nine for a second. So the nine says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. That's all we have. But let's just take a look at this story here in this context. So let's read it from verse 7. So the devil went out from the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from his feet to his head. And he took a portrait to scrape away the discharge and set upon a, a dung heap outside the city. And when much time had passed, which means it's not just next day. Much time had passed. It's like it's been a while like this in this situation. And his wife said to him, How long wilt thou hold out, saying, Behold, I wait yet a little while, expecting the hope of our deliverance. For behold, thy memorial is abolished from the earth, even thy son and daughter, the pang and pains of my womb, which I bore in vain with sorrow. And thou, and thou thyself, actually, let me, Sit it down to spare the night and the open air among the corruptions of wombs. And I am a wanderer and a servant from place to place and house to house waiting for the setting of the suns that I may reset uh, the rest from my labors and my p the pangs which now bes uh, beset me. But say some word against the Lord and die. Which is... It's like, wait, hold on, what a second. This is not what I read in verse 9. <laughs> There's a lot more there's a lot more story behind this one. Okay? This context is actually came from um the uh the Septu uh, Septuagint, which is the uh, which is the uh, the uh, the Greek version of the Bible which was used in Jesus' time. Okay? This is exact excerpt from that particular that's why you see it here on the left side here, this is all the Greeks. And it's just a translated in English. So what you see is a little different than what you just like saw here, right? So there is a lot more there, there are a lot more story behind this one. It's not just the you know, the wife just came to Job and it's like, you know, the next day after she lost everything, and he's like, Why don't you just curse out the God and die? That's not what she said. What it means is they both they both suffered for a while and she had to actually she was the like novel woman for a while and then but she had to actually work as a slave woman and then every day and night she was hoping it will get better but nothing was getting better yeah so she was she she couldn't resist anymore because there's no promise we don't know what it's going to be like so they they waited, waited, and they just, you know, you know, just like hoping there was some deliverance. Nothing was happening. So she was getting to the point and said, like, you know what? No need to wait for this deliverance. Curse out and die. There, there's no God. What are you talking about? So all the situations that we're talking about here this is the type of stuff that every one of them went through imagine Saul which is Paul when he was a preaching out to the people try to save their life and try to just you know to give them a, a, a you know the salvation what kind of treatment did he get well he was beaten up thrown into the prison right that's not that's not what we want for you know from our life for sure right so I want you to put your shoes I mean put yourself in their shoes what would you do in their their situation would you act differently would you say something differently You don't have to answer, but I would say our reactions is not going to be much different than Job's wife.
because it's like it's very difficult to keep our faith. We can keep the faith when everything is well and going well, just like the situation with Job. When when he was blessed, he's got like you know lots of children and lots of like you know uh, the animals. You know you're you're very rich. Of course, you can you can thank to the Lord. But when everything is lost, and not just you know a day or two, you lost for good, and there's no promise of whether you'll be restored or not. You'll be in completely different. You'll be in completely different situations at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the yeah. So this is the kind of situations we need to think about. What would I do if I'm in their shoes? What would I do? How do I? How would I act in these situations? And unfortunately, the hang on. Let me see if I can actually find it because he's not he's not showing us anything. You know, well, I read it here in the Bible, but I want to see. Show me. <clears throat> so, everyone that we just talked about, like Joseph, was in that situation. Even Moses. When he actually flee from Egypt after he killed you know, Egyptians, and then when he you know went to uh, the Medians, there's no there's no promise of what will happen to his life. He was living there as a shepherd for forty years, right? There's no promise that whether he will be restored or anything. So no promise for those the forty years. God never spoke to him, right? And when he reached the age eighty, then he spoke. To, God spoke to him. <clears throat> so it took 40 years so if you don't hear anything from God and no sign for 40 years what would you do like you you would think that God God's not there right <laughs> and same goes with Abraham you know God showed you know to him and said like I give you I'll give you a son well he waited for 25 years <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? You're giving me a son. <laughs> right? So this happens in our, our life. And then you're just act pretty much like, you know, live day by day without his guidance or instructions or sign. Like, wh- how would you react to that? And exactly this is where the David fall into. How did he react? Did he react, you know, foolishly, or he kept his promise and not not promise? He he kept his faith all along. So he literally went to Geth, the most dangerous place, you know, to him. And then when he reached there, he realized that you know when you you're coming back to the story again in chapter twenty three. Uh, uh, not chapter 23 I'm sorry um, 21 he said uh, uh, verse tw- uh, verse 12 and David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Akish, the king of Geth, so he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane. Because the Akish, the king of Geth, said, "Like, well, isn't he the 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 David who you know was supposed to be the king?" And and everyone was appraising about you know he killed like you know uh, ten thousand while the Saul king like thousand. Well. Soon as he heard that, he realized that he may actually kill him. So he changed his behavior and he just acted like you know is in a madman. Well, there is no protection from God. He had to actually change his behavior to just to save himself. There's no guidance from God. 
right? At this point, he just had no other place to hide, and he just went to a place where he could not, you know, he had to run to this most dangerous place to protect himself. And let's take a look at, at this point, at this point, and he wrote a psalm. And let's find out what he said in the psalm. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 34. Psalm chapter 34. Yeah, 34. So when you turn to Psalm chapter 34, uh, the subtitle of this is Of David when he changed his behavior before Ahimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. So let's read and let's just pay attention to what he's saying in this psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste, and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord your saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord elect no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desire life and love, loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears towards their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and save the crushed in spirit. May are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He keeps all his bones not one of them is broken. Affliction will lay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. When you look at this as psalm, wait a second. He's not in a good place to even have this kind of praise. You can have this kind of you know praise when things are good, not in a situation where he is right now. It's definitely not something that we can imagine that he say something like this. His future, his tomorrow is unknown, and is just no promise. And what he's doing is praise the Lord, and and it's astonishing. How can you praise at this situations like this? You praising the Lord at this stage of your life? This is not the song of praise when he became a king. This was when he was actually being chased by the King Saul and he has to worry about his life every day. And now he got to the point where he's like enemies about to kill him and then he had to actually act like a madman in front of the, the, his enemy. So we can see there are two distinctive behavior we will see. One will just deny God and abandon God and they abandon their faith. Or there are people like David and continue to be faithful and see his salvation at the end. When you read the Bible, at the end, he always restores. It's just 
not the time when we're expecting. But he restores every single time. Right? So, we have to put ourselves in their shoes and, wow, you know, this is not easy for us to really behave the way the King David behaved. It is very difficult for Joseph the way he behaved. And then we may see and we may say, you know what? Because they're Joseph, because of their King David, yeah, yeah, they're, they're special people. They're, they're not like ordinary people. They're not like me. Of course, they're like very, very, you know, faithful, faithful persons. And, you know, it's like they're very special, not like us. And I will tell you, not really. Not really. You know, I, I told you about what, you know, he lied. Right? He lied. Yeah. Why, he, why those are stories in here? If this book was written by a man, we'll remove that. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> That's not good to show to people that this, like, righteous people lying or they're, like, you know, having, you know, adulterous act. Well, hey, hey, hey. Remove that piece. Rip it off. Right? Let's just keep the good side of the, that man. Right? And then it's like, let, let people believe in this. But God left everything here. Whether it's good or bad, it's all in here. Why? As I told you before, even though David is a representation of a Jesus, he himself is not Jesus. What Bible is showing is how imperfect we are. We, no one is righteous. Even David is not righteous. He shows here their fault. They're, everyone is a sinner. Every man are a sinner. It doesn't really matter who they are. We're all sinner. God is a showing. We are like this. But there are, even though we are a sinner, there are people who strive and waiting for the God's the salvation like King David did so if you put into a hard and difficult situations I want you to remember how they behaved not I'm not asking you to follow what Joseph did or King David did that's not what I'm saying and as I said before it's very difficult for us to act like them. Then what can we do? This is where we have to kneel down and pray to the Lord and say, Lord, you know me. You know my fate is very weak. You know I'm not like them at all. But you know what? As you promised me, I can do everything if you give me the strength. Just because you give me the strength, I can do this. So help me, Lord. Because I know I cannot do it, but through you, I can. So come down here. We're going to take a look at chapter 22. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Abdullam. And when he bro uh, his brother and all his father's house heard, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Let's just take a look at this. Who came to David? What kind of people came to David? His family, right? And then everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. Yeah? Not rich, not well life, but people who are in need. 
So let's think about it. when Jesus came. Who are gathered by Jesus? Rich or leaders? Who Jesus went and who came to Jesus? Sick people, right? Widows, crazy people, right? People who are in need. They, they could not live their life without help. That's why they came to Jesus, asking for help to be healed, right? Driven out of all this, like, you know, the craziness or the, like, evil spirits, right? Widows who need help, they all came to Jesus. Same thing. What happened to David? The people who are in need came to David. Why did David's family come to him? Why did David come in you know, a family come to him? When you think about it, David was the youngest son. Right? He was the youngest. So all his siblings are like his his older brothers. Right, and older brothers were the member of the King Saul's army. Remember when he was actually, you know, in the battlefield with the King Saul when they were against the Philistine? They were with Saul. They're part of the uh, Saul's army. But after David flee from Saul, obviously his family was persecuted. He couldn't. They could not stay with Saul anymore because. You know, they're a family of a David. So they are always in danger. So they had no place. So they had to come to David because that's the, probably the safest place. So as much as, you know, David was the chased by King Saul, their family was chased by King Saul as well. So they had no place to go to other than coming to David. So most of the people who are gathered, they're not really warrior they're not like strong people. They're not like, you know, they're, they're, they're not uh, rich people. Not, not like people where you're expecting. But all these people are in need came to David. Continue on, verse 3. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab. And they stayed with him all the times that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Now, he left his mother and father at the king of Moab. So Moab, are they a friendly country to uh, Israel? No, no, not at all. Moab is not a friendly country to uh, Israel. So he had to leave his family with the king of Moab, which is the enemy of Israel, because he had no other place to leave their family, because nowhere in Israel is a safe. So he had to leave his family with the hands of his enemy. And then Prophet Gad said, you should go back. What is it God, you know, Gad is telling David? You have to go back to Israel. Means <laughs> you'll be chased after King Saul. It's not a pleasant thing to hear. You have to go back. But he went there again. He flee from Israel, but Gad was telling him to go back. So he went back. Now Saul heard that David was uh, discovered, of course. Now as soon as he came back, you know, there was a, someone reporting him that he came back, right? And the men who were with him, Saul was uh, sitting at uh, Gibeah under the uh, 
tamarisk tree on the heights with his spear in his hand and all his servant were standing about him and Saul said to his servant who stood about him here now people of Benjamin will the son of Jesse give every one of you field and vineyard will he make uh, make you all the commanders of a thousands a commander of a hundreds that all of you have a, uh, conspired against me no one this goes to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jess, none of you is none of you is sorry for, uh, for me or this goes to me that my son has uh, stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait and at his day then answer Doek the Edomite who stood by the servant of Saul's I saw the son of Jess coming to Nope to Ahimelech the son of uh, um, Ahihu and inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath and the Philistine then the king sent to Suman Ahimelech the priest the son of Ahitub and all his father's house and priests who were at Nope and all of them came to the king and Saul said, Here now, son of uh, Ehitu. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jess, in that you have given him bread and a sword and inquired of God for him, so that he has arisen against me to lie in wait as at this day? Dahimelech answered the king, and who among all your servants is so faithful as David, who is the king's son-in-law and ca uh, captain over your bodyguard and honor in your house? Is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? No, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father. All your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech you and all your father's house and the king said to the guard who stood about him and turn and kill the priest of the lord because their hand also is with david and they knew he fled and did not disclose it to me but the servant of the king would not put out their hands to strike the priest of of the lord then the king of uh, the king said to doeg you turn and strike the priest and doeg the Edomite turned and struck down the priest and he killed all on that day 85 persons who were the linen epod and nope the city of priests that he put to sword both men and women and ch a child and infant ox donkey and sheep and he put to the sword but one of the son of Ahimelech the son of Ahitu named Abiathar escaped and fled after David and Abiathar told David that Saul had to kill the priest of the Lord and David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasion, uh, occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not be afraid, for he who seek my life seeks your life. With me you shall be in safe keeping. So, Saul well, without really trying to understand what the situations were like, because the priest at Nope gave David a bread, five loaves of bread, and the sword of Goliath, and Saul actually put them as if they were the rebellions. Oh, you're actually, you know, kind of like, you know you united with the uh, david's people and you're trying to just like strike me back and you're actually you know try to rebel against me well priest of nope that was not the intention at all david came as a hungry man he gave that bread and david said i actually came as the the king's order you know, I, 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 I was rushed out. I forgot to actually bring my sword. So if you have a sword, so give me that sword so that I can actually do the work that God, I mean, the, the king was assigned me to do. So the priest of Nobe gave that, you know, sword. That's what you brought here. And, and you take it what you brought here. That's all they did. But because of that, they were killed. So think about this for a second. King Saul 
is the king, or anointed. There are only three types of people who are anointed back then. Who are they? King, priest, and prophets. There's only three types of people get anointed. There's no other people get anointed. There are only three types of people. King, priest, and prophet. There's only three types. So, king is anointed one. Priest is also anointed one. Saul is not afraid to kill anointed priest for him for 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 his needs and for what he wanted he was not afraid to kill the anointed priest he's not hesitant to kill kill them so let's put this in perspective here remember when Samuel told Saul to get rid of all the Amalekites and kill the uh, the men and women and children and oxen and all these like animals and wipe them all. And then he spared, he spared a good animals and he spared a king of, you know, uh, Amalekites, Agok, right? And now this time, he's not hesitant to kill anyone, but he killed people. The priest, he killed the children, men and women, every animals that they had. Wiped them out. And only Abiathar was the only one who escaped from that in a massacre. Right? So when he got order from God to wipe out the Amalekite, he was rebelled against the God and did not keep the word. But when he was killing the people of Nope, he's no, you know, he... He had no uh, uh, yeah that's the word, what's the word that I, it's not yeah it's a, there's no remorse but he just like he's not willing to spare anything he he did not he did not actually you know he wouldn't mind to kill everyone right yeah so he behaved very differently this time right. And then when he told his you know commanders to kill the the priest, and I said like, <laughs> no, I don't want to kill the priest. <laughs> so they did. They just like, you know, they did not want to do anything with the priest. And then since no one was trying to kill, you know, the priest, he told Doeg, which is the Edomite, and said, go and kill him. And obviously he was the uh, Edomites. He wouldn't mind killing the uh, uh, the priest because he's got nothing to do with the priest, right? He doesn't believe in God. <coughs> so let's think about this. <coughs> when Jesus came, who was the king? <coughs> All right, King Herod. He was <coughs> he was from Idume. Idume is actually Edomite. He's an Edomite. <coughs> So Edomite was trying to kill <coughs> righteous men. Same thing. Doeg, as Edomite, killed a priest. No, uh, no uh, pity. He's just killing everyone. So he actually came to Saul's and reported that he actually... You know the priest gave the bread to uh, the David. So from his perspective, you know he was looking for some some reward, right? So for his own benefit, he just reported this, and he would not mind to kill all the priests. Not a problem. So he went and killed all this. And Abiathar was the only priest who escaped out of that, and that went to King David and reported it. <coughs> so all this priest, no wrongdoing. Right, they did what they supposed to do, but they get they get killed by King Saul. 
Let's take a look at the other story here. Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, let's turn to uh, Psalm chapter fifty two. Psalm chapter 52. <clears throat> to the choir master, a masculine of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. So this praise was written when Doeg actually uh, you know came to Saul and reporting what happened to uh to um, uh what happened there so let's read why do you boast of evil o mighty men the steady love of god endure all the day your tongue plots destructions like a sharp razor you workers of deceit you love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue, <clears throat> but God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. You will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear, and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make good a uh, God his refuge but trusted to him in him abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destructions but i am like a green olive tree in the house of god i trust in the steadfast love of god forever and ever i will thank you forever because you have done it i will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the guilt uh, godly <coughs> so this is the praise that he wrote, that the, the David wrote, when Doeg reached out to Saul's and reported that what happened. So when you look at this, he was talking about the righteous person and the evil persons. But even though their evil person do what they think it is right, but I'm going to be different for me. So when you read verse 7, See the man who would not make God in his refuge, but trust in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destructions. So there's a So there are people who rely on their richness, what they have, because they trusted in what what they own and what they have, rather than take the refuge in the Lord. There's a two distinctive Verse 8, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to be part of those people who rely on what they have or what they trust. I put all my hope, I put all my, you know, you know, the stuff to the Lord. And he is my refuge and he's the only one who protects me. I don't have a, no other things to rely on. God is the only my salvation so he put everything in in God because when you think about it he has nothing else to rely on right he could rely on 400 people who gather but look at look at the people around him they're, they're not something he can rely on right so all he had was just Lord I don't have anything you're only my refuge you're the only one who can save me. You're the only one who could actually, you know, protect me. So he put everything in the Lord. And once again, God truly protects the one who rely on him. At the end of the old story, you know, we know all the story. How, how would it happen? How the Saul's ended his life and how his kingdom, you know, was perished versus how the King David's kingdom 
was endure. All right, we see the end. The person who rel rely on God and how it turned out at the end, and you see the Saul who rely on his own richness and his powers and his positions. You know how he perished. His family was perished. So, regardless of the situations we're in, we're learning that we have to continually rely on the Lord to protect us because he's the only refuge we have you know think about it we're living in a situation this is probably something that we're going to tell our children in the future to say you know there was a time that we were going through this you know pandemic and no one was going out of uh, their house this was a really bad time and scary time now who would protect us in this situation who is our protection? The Lord is my protection. It's the only thing we can rely on. So, it is just, it is just truly our heart, who we truly rely on. What do we trust? Do we trust what we have? Versus, do we trust the Lord? One or the other. It's your choice. No one's going to force you to make that decision. It's your choice to make. Whether you rely on what you have in this world versus what we rely on our Lord. One or the other. And then take a look at verse tw uh, uh, chapter 23. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against the uh, Kela. This uh, and the robbing the th uh, threshing floor. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack this Philistine? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistine and save Kela. So David man, David's man said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Kela against the armies of the Philistine? Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Kela, and for I will give the Philistines who uh, into your hand. And David and his men went to Kela and fought with the Philistine and brought away their livestock and struck them with uh, a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Kela. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Kela, he had come down with the epode in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Kela, and Saul said, God has given me into my hand, for he has to shut himself in by entering a town that he, he has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Kela to besiege David and and his uh, and his men. David knew that King uh, uh, Saul was plotting harm against him, and uh, said to Abiathar the priest, to "Bring the epod here." So let's take a look at this incident here. There's two comparison. I mean, there's a comparison here between David and Saul. So he heard uh, David heard the news that Philistine is attacking the people of Kela. So he doesn't have to help these people. Right, he he's just he's just like you know busy protecting himself and his people. He doesn't have to do anything with this, but he had a heart to 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 help this people of Kela. So he reached out to God and said, "Lord, what should I do? Should I go?" So God said, "Go and help them out." And then his people was afraid. What are you talking about? We're going where to help out these people? What, are you crazy? <laughs> and he went back to the Lord, confirming it. Lord, are you going to deliver these people to me? And God said, yep, I will deliver the Philistine to your hands. Rise up, go. So he went there to, to you know, the fight against the Philistine. And Saul heard the news. Obviously, there was a someone who reported that he actually showed up in a, the town of Akela. 
everywhere David go, there's someone reporting it to Saul. Wherever he appear, there's a some guy telling Saul. And now Saul was happy. Wow. God must have given David to my hands because God actually put him in the place in a town where there's a there's a gate and a bar to lock him up. So this must be God doing this to kill him. Okay. So we're seeing the two two different um uh, uh case here. One, David is helping out the people that he didn't he doesn't have to help, but he's willing to go and help his people. And he went to the Lord and asking and inquired of the Lord, should I go, Lord? Will you actually give this people to my hands? And then God said, yeah, go ahead. Go and help them. On the other hand, Saul, he's not asking God. He's not getting any answer from Lord. He's pretending God must be doing this. God is giving you know, David into my hands. Because you, God actually put David and his people in this Kela, and where it has a gate and a bar, it must be God doing this. He's, pre, he's actually you know, assume that God is actually giving David to his hands. So there's two different behavior. One, he's doing he, the work that he doesn't need to do to help out, whereas Saul was just blinded. And he just wants to kill David. That's all he wants. And David, uh, King Saul knows that David was the chosen one. But he's not, he's not afraid of ki kill David. So, King Saul is keep saying, <laughs> keep saying, it is the Lord who delivered David to my hands. Right? He's just keep bringing up the Lord is with him. He was abandoned a long time ago. Right? But he was just keep bringing, oh, Lord is actually with me. And then he's delivering David to my hands. Where did he, where did he, where did he get this idea? Right? He's imagining. Right? He's got his, he's got, he's got, right? He's got his own faith. <laughs> There's a, there's a, some kind of God that's like thinking that he's actually helping him, right? So you have to see, there's a God of David, and there's a God of Saul. They call the same as a Jehovah, but they're two different gods, okay? The David who calls on God's name is a real God. There's another God, Saul is a seeking, right? He's thinking that he's actually with him, is a, is a bogus God, is a fake God, it's nothing to do with the real God, right? He's he's imagining of another God that is, is helping him. Okay, this is going back to the story that I mentioned a few weeks ago. I'm sorry? Okay, so this goes back to the same thing, you know, I mentioned before. Remember I mentioned that even in church, everybody calls on Jesus' name. Everybody believe in Jesus as our savior. Okay? However, there is there is a, a people who truly call on Jesus' name and believe that Jesus who was written in the Bible. Whereas there are people, the group of people who believe in Jesus, but they don't know anything about the Bible, but they want to believe what they want to believe. In their heart, they created a God called Jesus, but that's not the God who actually written in the Bible. So they have their own uh, idol. They put their name on Jesus, and they follow, they praise, they worship, they do everything just like the rest of the people. But there's a two, two different God. <laughs> it's it's a name the same as Jesus, but one is true, the other one is a fake God. It, we fall into the this exact same trap. How you mentioned so how do we avoid you know not falling into this kind of trap? It's very easy. You have to know what God said in the Bible and know the Jesus way it is written in the Bible, not what you imagine, not what you want to hear. That's different God. 
And many of the Christians fall into this trap very easily because they don't know God. And I told you many times, we do everything. We worship, we praise, we pr- you know, pray, we go to retreat, we go to this Bible sharing or Bible studies. We do all kinds of stuff. What they don't have in their heart is desire to learn about the Word. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't have a desire to know the Word, that means you don't have desire to know Jesus, because you have to know who Jesus is written in the format the way the Bible says. So if you don't know Jesus, then you don't know who Jesus is. Then what is the what is the God that you believe then? If you don't know who He is and what are you believing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is just nothing more than a superstition. You know, people just like believe in their own God. Right? They just heard about this here or there, but they don't know who who God they're believing in. This is a very easy trap for anyone or any Christians to fall into. So when you actually talk to those Christians, you know, first of all, they don't have a desire to know Bible. They don't have a desire to read. They don't have any desire to get to know Jesus. All they enjoy is just attending the worship service. They enjoy the pray, you know, singing, right? They just like donate money, right? Right? That's not the that's not what God wants. I want you to know me. Get to know me. But that's the one thing that people refuse. So. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, it's exactly the same thing. So, we have to kind of like evaluate our faith what am I believing in what kind of God that I actually trust and 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 pray to I mean the whole reason why we're actually gathered here to learn the Bible is because we don't know much about the Bible we didn't we didn't actually go through this you know lengthy process to, to get to really read the bibles and meditate and try to understand what he's saying that hasn't really happened throughout our you know church life we had opportunity you know attending our bible sh- you know the study here there but it's not as consistent as this you know it was a more you know uh you know subject base and or or just a, like you know one particular book or they're just like it's very segmented but it's not giving you the full picture of the bible so you had to you had a puzzles everywhere you got like small pieces here there like but what is this what is this puzzle puzzle looks like you you never actually was able to put this puzzles back together and then see the big picture right when we talk about small things here or there you know the story but you don't know how to put this together well what does this picture looks like i don't know well that's a problem this is where our church is failing. We hear the sermons every week. But this everywhere. It's jumping from like Old Testament, New Testament, like that a subject is changing this to that. Like, you know, one day is a prayer, one day is fate, one another day is something else. Like it's it's everywhere. Not organize it. Not through beginning to the end. I mean I I told you this before. That's not how we actually study in this world. So imagine, <clears throat> you know, R- Ricky is actually, you know, uh, to teach the, the people, you know, the how to play piano. One day, actually, oh, let me show you how to play. It's like jazz music. I show you all this, like, fancy chord, blah, 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 blah. Like, uh, look at this. Yeah, crazy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and and next time the guy yeah yeah next next day the, the next time he comes like you know what you know let's just do some classic music like that's like that's cool right 
And then the next, next, next time he comes, like you know, let me let me show you this. How cool this like funky music looks. Like, like okay, it's cool, but what am I learning? <laughs> I'm not learning it. It's cool, but like I'm not learning anything. Okay, show me, show me how to like read the note first. If you don't have a strong base, no matter what you build, it's never going to be stable, right? What is the base? I mean, like I said, you know, in order for anyone, like a person like me, is like, you know, Keith, uh, you don't know anything about music, so let me just teach you about some music here. So, like, first of all, like, do you know how to read a note? Okay, do, do, do you know what this means? Okay, let me teach you how to read the notes, okay? You're not going to get into like, uh, let me show you how to actually play this chord at the very beginning. Well, that's not where you, you, where you, where, how you teach. You have to teach me the very basic of what music is about. The rhythm is important. So you have to explain to me about the music, right? The melodies and all this stuff. Like you have to teach the most basic stuff. Once I get hang of it and once I actually understand a little bit, then you start building on top of that. That's how we normally learn that's how we normally teach others. But look at how we're learning in, the, in, in, in church. That's not how we learn. Right? One day, the new guy who just come to show up in church, and what you do is just to hear the sermons. All of a sudden, it popped up here, there. Like, every week, there's some different topics. Right? And then all we hear it is, believe in the Lord. What Lord? Who is the Lord? Who is Jesus? Right? So this is the part where we need to like, you know, shift our gears and say, I want to know who Jesus is first. Before I even talk about faith, I want to know who he is, what he said. If you don't know what he said and who he is, and how am I supposed to believe in him? So these stuff that we're going through is just like, not only we're actually learning, but we're, we're actually building on top of what we're learning. And from Genesis up, up till now, and, you know, my theme has been always been the same across the board. It's about Jesus and his salvation and who he are and who he is. It's the, that's the base. And there are always a comparison of a people who just trust in their own heart. You know, they have their own faith. They have their own God they follow and they believe versus David who knows who God is and follow after his heart. So who, wh what type of faith do we have? Do we have a faith to follow Jesus the way it was written? If, if that is the way that you have the right base and your faith will go into the right path. But if you go to the path that you want to believe, the things that you want to see and you, you, you want to believe, then you're going on a wrong path. And no matter how deep you are in, that fate is, is worthless. You're wasting your time on it. So we have to just evaluate ourselves and say, is my fate is a right? Or am I believing something like fake? Do I believe the right God or do I believe the fake God? Which God do I believe? Yeah. So, as we go through the story, you know, we have to be able to actually see uh, what the story is about. Uh, I want to actually. I, won't, I wanted to actually finish this uh, chapter twenty-three, but I guess it, it, we just ran over the time. So, up to this, do you have any questions about the topics that we talked about? 